Who's your little friend, Davy? Asks the tall woman in the blue overalls, who I assume is David Clark's mom. I mean, who else would she be? I guess she could be a painter, what with the blue overalls and the white paint on her face and hands. A friendly painter who calls David Davy and comes to the door when someone knocks at it. I'm Lily Madwhip, I tell her. And I just got mugged out on the sidewalk. Oh my goodness, she gasps, covering her mouth with her hand dramatically. You poor thing. In this neighborhood? Let's get you cleaned up. Davy, go call 911. David looks at his mother coldly for some reason, and then turns and heads upstairs. If I ever looked at my mother like that, I'd probably get a boot up my butt. I wonder which room is his. I bet he has green wallpaper. He seems like a green person. Green people are always calm and like to sit in the woods and listen to birds and stuff. Not like red people. Red people like to bang on the walls with hammers and scream at passing chipmunks. Red people are crazy. Me? I'm blue. Mrs. Clark watches him go and then turns to me, still smiling. Let's go into the bathroom and wash off those scrapes. Those look nasty. She takes me by the end and leads me through their living room. The walls are all bare, but I can see where there used to be photos or paintings or maybe posters because the paint is darker in rectangular places and faded everywhere else. Then again, maybe they just like painting rectangles and darker patches on their walls. People do weird things to decorate their homes, like sticking clothes into oranges and hanging them up until they rot and turn black. The furniture in the room looks like stuff you find at an auction after someone dies. Lots of wicker. People in the old days really liked making stuff out of wicker. I don't even know what wicker is, really. I think it should be called viner, because it looks like they just wound up a bunch of vines until you could sit on it. The Clarks even have a wicker table with a glass top and an old-looking candlestick phone on it. My nana had a candlestick phone. I used to always talk in the wrong end. Next comes the kitchen. Everything in here is mint green. The fridge, the oven, the counters, even the table and chairs. I guess they got lucky having mint green kitchen furniture that matched all the appliances. Imagine if they moved in with cherry red furniture. <laughs> that would have been disastrous. I know color scheming well because of all my painting I like to do. I am shocked, shocked, Mrs. Clark says. <gasps> Her hands are cold. I thought this neighborhood was safe. I can't believe someone would mug an 11-year-old girl in broad daylight right outside my own home. It could have been worse, I say. I could have got stabbed. Maybe she didn't hear about the stabbing. Or the house that exploded that was the reason she was able to get this home for probably next to nothing. I mean, after the stuff that has happened to me the past few years, a mugging seems pretty mild. Getting mugged is a walk in the park. I mean that literally. If you were out for a walk in the park here, you'd probably get mugged. The bathroom is connected to the kitchen by a door that apparently is split in two at the middle, so you can leave the top of the door open but close the bottom. You know, in case you want to sit on the toilet but carry on a conversation with everybody sitting at the dinner table. A bathroom door you can half close seems like a pretty bad idea to me. Someone's going to get confused and close the top without closing the bottom and then everybody eating dinner gets a free show. Mrs. Clark makes me sit on the toilet, mint green like the kitchen, as she rummages through a bunch of stuff hidden in a compartment behind the mirror. There's containers of pills, lots of containers of pills, and old rolled up toothpaste and boxes of bandages and a big clear plastic bottle that says rubbing alcohol on it. She knocks over a few pill containers trying to find something before going, aha, and pulling out a bag of cotton swabs along with the bandages and the rubbing alcohol. Oh no, not rubbing alcohol. That's parent torture techniques number 30. Rub alcohol on your kids' wounds. Apparently someone decided long ago that alcohol kills germs and if you rub it on a boo-boo, it kills germs and makes your kids regret getting hurt to begin with so that they learn better not to do whatever stupid thing they did that got them hurt. Like when I tried to ride Roger's skateboard down the driveway on my tummy and hit a bump and flew off it face first. Mom used the same torture technique to clean the scrape on my forehead. It felt like she was setting my forehead on fire and then bees were trying to put the fire out by stinging it. All right, Lulu, Mrs. Clark says to me, time to put on your brave face. 
This is my brave face, I tell her, and my name is Lily. The fire starts in my knees. I clamp down with my hands on the toilet seat cover and grip my teeth to keep from screaming. Mrs. Clark almost looks pleased as she rubs the alcohol-soaked swab on my scrapes. Next come the bees to put out the fire. They sting my kneecaps like they're mad at me. I felt worse. But when it's happening, you don't tend to think about how much worse it was getting your face slashed by a hypnotized classmate or your ribs broken in a car accident. I need to distract myself from the burning bee stings, so I just start talking. For Easter, when I was six years old, my brother Roger got rabbit turds from his friend Skeeter, whose family owned bunnies, and put them in some of the plastic eggs that the Easter bunny hid. I know it's not the Easter bunny now, but at the time I thought it was. So I found one of the eggs on Easter morning and opened it up and thought they were chocolate candies and ate like two before I realized that they were way too salty to be eat chocolate. Roger sat there and watched me eat them and then started laughing. He thought it was so hilarious that he told everybody at school about it. Mrs. Clark stops picking little bits of gravel out of my skin for a second and looks at me like a dog when you talk gibberish at it. Excuse me? She asks. Sorry. This really hurts and I just need to talk. Oh, okay. She uses her pinky nail to dig something out from under a small flap of skin on my knee. I bite my lip to keep from screaming. This woman acts like she's never cleaned a child's boo-boo before. Anyway, I wanted to get Roger back for tricking me into eating rabbit turds. So a month later when he'd forgotten all about it, but I hadn't because you don't forget when your brother makes you eat animal poop, I took the nasty water from my betta fish's tank. His name was Ray Charles because he was blind and just swam in circles. I don't know if the real Ray Charles swam in circles, but my fishy did. Anyway, I let his water get real stinky and gross for the past month. Not that I ever cleaned his tank, but it was my job to remind my dad to do it and I didn't. Mrs. Clark peels a large band-aid out of its wrapper and sticks it on the giant scrape on my right knee. It quickly turns dark with blood on the little pad. I can see blood drops already trying to ooze out of the little band-aid pores. She rubs it with her thumb and smears blood on my leg. That's rather unsanitary, but I don't say anything. Huh, <sighs> so... I took all that filthy fish water with fish pee and poo in it and I poured it into a big pitcher my mom used for making sun tea. The water was already pretty yellow, but I added a huge scoop of lemonade powder to it and even cut up a lemon with a knife. I wasn't allowed to use sharp knives, so it was tricky, but I cut it up and put the slices in the lemon-flavored fish water. Then I put it in the fridge for Roger to find and drink. Oh no, you didn't! She clicks her tongue at me and shakes her head. That's very gross. Not as gross as smearing my blood with your thumb, I think. It was foolproof, but it turned out my dad found the picture first while I was outside drawing on the sidewalk with chalk. He'd been mowing the lawn and was all sweaty, and I didn't think he'd drink lemonade because he always says he hates sour stuff. But he did. He drank the lemon fishy water and then started barfing, like over and over again. And then he went to the hospital. Because I guess drinking that sort of thing isn't good for you. Mrs. Clark presses another bandage on my other knee. It isn't as bad as the right one, so blood doesn't ooze out of the pores. She looks up at me with her brown eyes. Something about her expression gives me a shiver. It reminds me of this one time I saw Roger in the front yard with our mom's magnifying glass. He was hovering it over the entrance to an anthill and cackling whenever another ant would scurry out and a second later writhe on the dirt and then pop with a little puff of smoke. He had this gleeful grin on his face, and his eyes were just like Mrs. Clark's. She's looking at me with a calm face, but eyes like I'm an ant on the other side of the magnifying glass. So then my dad was in the hospital, and my mom had no idea what happened, and I just knew I'd poison him with my fishy lemonade, so I dumped it all back in the fish tank and tried to hide it. Mrs. Clark frowns. Wait, where was your fish? Oh, it was still in the tank. By then it was dead because fish can't live out of water for very long. I bite my lip. I didn't know what I was doing, okay? I was six. 
I thought for sure nobody would figure out what I had done, but of course my mom came up to my room that night to talk to me about how my dad was going to be okay, and while she was talking, she noticed Ray Charles floating belly up in his tank with a bunch of lemon slices. Mrs. Clark stares off into space like she's trying to process all of this information I just gave her. And then she stands up and does that thing with her hands where she acts like she's got dust on them and is trying to brush it off, but there's nothing. It's a thing all adults like to do, along with folding their arms and tilting their heads so that their glasses slide down their noses and then looking at you over the tops of them. Do you feel better now? She asks. Did you know dust is partially made of dead human skin? Her lip twitches. You know a lot of facts. She says through her teeth. You must read a lot. Mrs. Clark turns away to make like she's washing her hands. Before she does, though, I see her casually lick the thumb that's got my blood on it. I think she didn't want me to see her do it, and I can't blame her. That's really weird. Is she a vampire? No, vampires don't actually exist. Or maybe they do. Dracula is real, but so is Jesus. Both of them were dead once and came back. After licking her thumb, she actually does wash her hands without using the soap and shakes them off instead of touching the hand towel. The towel is covered with little teddy bears holding valentine hearts. I can understand not wanting to dry your hands on that. Like maybe the cutesiness will rub off. While she's busy washing her hands in the laziest way possible, I glance around the bathroom. One of the pill bottles from the mirror cabinet thing is by my foot, so I roll it over with my foot to read the label. A-L-L-O-P-U-R-I-N-O-L I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Maybe like allopurinol? Pasher could tell me what it's for. It's too bad he's not here. He could tell me a lot of things. Okay, I admit it, I miss him. I need to focus on Meredith, though. I've got to find out who clocked me and took her. All right. Mrs. Clark finishes shaking off her hands. Let's go into the kitchen and get you a cookie, and I'll go check on Davy. I follow her back to the kitchen full of mint green stuff and sit at the mint green metal table on a mint green metal chair. Mrs. Clark gets a cookie jar shaped like a sleeping kitty off the top of the mint green fridge and opens it, offering the contents to me. I peek inside. The sleeping kitty is half full of Fig Newtons. Yuck. I hate Fig Newtons, but I take one without thinking. You know these aren't cookies, right? They're fruit and cake. Mrs. Clark blinks and then shakes her head. Okay. I hold the Fig Newton between my fingers and study it. I'm not a fan of Newtons. They taste funny, like you're eating sugared squirrel guts. Not that I've tasted sugared squirrel guts, but I've got a vivid imagination, my therapist says. You wait right there and don't move, and I'll be back in a jiffy. She smiles at me, her eyes still looking at me like Roger frying ants, then does some sort of weird little dance shuffle with her feet and walks off towards the front of the house. I hear her go upstairs, and a moment later a door shuts loudly. So I sit and wait and try not to focus on the bee stings in my knees and the palms of my hands. I don't like to wait. Waiting gets you killed. Especially in strange kitchens full of mint green furniture. I mean, I've never actually been killed to confirm this, or been in a strange kitchen full of mint green furniture. But I've gotten pretty close, and I know plenty of people who have. Been killed, that is. None of them were in a kitchen like this one. It's just something about this room screams somebody's going to die here. <sighs> I really wish Meredith was here. We could talk about how ugly mint green is together. I hope she stays still and quiet for whoever stole her from me. If they find out she can talk and wiggle, they might sell her to a collector or someone. Like Pinocchio, where he got sold to a puppet guy. Oh my god, Meredith could end up turning into a donkey if that happened. I'd feel so bad if Meredith turns into a donkey. Worse than I feel now. One of the tiles in the kitchen floor is coming up. I don't think I noticed that before. Not that I was looking at the floor. I was kind of too busy noticing how mint green everything is in here. I hop up off the chair, ignoring the bee stings in my knees, and go check out this tile because it's like the only thing in the entire kitchen that doesn't seem to be spick and span. 
The counters are clean as whistles. The appliances look like they got bought at the store just yesterday. Maybe they did. But this one black floor tile is sticking up, and if I was whoever cleaned this kitchen, that would bug the heck out of me. I get up and go to the tile, then lift it and peek under. There's a mushroom growing up through a crack in the floor beneath. It's a weird orangey color and looks all swollen and wet like a blister. How did nobody not notice this mushroom or this tile? Did it just sprout up seconds ago? Maybe it did. I don't know how mushrooms work. I don't even know what a mushroom scientist is called. A fungologist or something, probably. Pick me, the mushroom says. Well, not really, but it's so out of place that it's like it's begging me to fix things by removing it. I squat down and try to pick the mushroom. It does not want to come up. I thought mushrooms were supposed to be soft and come up easily. This one struggles like a rubber band caught on a nail. Suddenly, I'm surrounded by darkness. Did the sun go out? I hear moaning. Some sort of low moan, kind of like in a zombie movie. I've heard moaning like this before. When I was at the hospital and my dad was in a coma, there were people in their beds in other rooms and some of them moaned like this. Like they were in a lot of pain but couldn't say anything. Maybe they lost their tongues. That would certainly hurt, I think. Not that I have experience with it. Something moves in the darkness. It's a face. An old person judging by the wrinkles and the spots my mom calls liver spots. Their eyes are white. Like all white. Like they don't really have eyes. Someone just painted two white slits on their face. I want to scream for a second, but then I recognize the face. I've seen him before. I just can't remember where. An old man, wrinkled face, white eyes. Well, obviously, he didn't have the wide eyes when I saw him, or I'd have screamed then. But he's the one moaning. Help. Me. Suddenly, I'm back in the kitchen. Ooh, it's been a while since I've had a vision like that. I feel dizzy from the jolt of being here again, and I teeter backward. In doing so, the mushroom I'm holding rips at the stem with a gross sound, and I fall into my butt with the blister shroom in my hands. It's leaking red stuff that looks like blood. Maybe it is blood. I didn't think mushrooms bled, but this one is draining into my hands like I ripped the arm off of a dog or something. That's a terrible analogy, and the thought of it makes me want to barf. Also, the sickly sweet smell wafting off the mushroom as it oozes blood-like stuff into my hands is nasty. I drop the shroom onto the kitchen floor. The rest of the stem sticking up under the tile is pumping more of the vomit-smelling juice stuff like a hose some kid keeps pinching to stop the water from coming out. Little spurts. Ugh, it smells so gross. I need to tell the clerks or they're going to come back and freak out like I'm freaking out. Maybe even worse because this stuff looks just like blood. Uh, I cry out. Help! Nobody comes to help. I scramble up and dash into the front hall of the house where the walls are that weird pink color old folks always like to paint the insides of their houses. I wonder if a hundred years ago all they had was this off pink color for paint so everybody just painted their walls like that. Upstairs, I can hear talking in one of the rooms. All the doors are shut, so I can't make out what they're saying. I run up the stairs, feeling the band-aids on my knees pulling at my skin. I try not to touch the walls or banisters, so I don't get this red blister shroom juice all over the house. I don't want to make the inside of the house look like a crime scene. That's the outside. That's the crime scene. Oh god, this day just keeps getting worse. Yes, she's downstairs. I can hear David through one of the doors. It sounds like he's talking on the phone. I lift my clean fist to knock. I gave her one of the cookies. Mrs. Clark comments, just like you said to. Uh, what? I look at the Fig Newton partially squished in my knocking hand. I had forgotten I was holding it. Why would Mrs. Clark be told to give me one of these? Are they poisoned? The door swing open in front of me suddenly. Mrs. Clark is standing there. David is behind her, holding a black telephone. There's a huge canopy bed in the room with lacy curtains covered in flower patterns. 
the smell of mothballs wafts out. I recognize it from all the visits to my Uncle George's cabin in the woods. They would put mothballs on all the furniture whenever they left to keep the moths off it, I guess. What are you doing here? Mrs. Clark asks in a less nice-sounding voice than she had downstairs. Smelling mothballs, I say. They look at each other. No, Mrs. Clark says. I mean, why are you up here? I told you to wait downstairs. She then notices my hand covered in shroom juice. Oh my God, what happened? You're bleeding. That's why I came upstairs, I tell her. Wait, that's not the right way to start this. I mean, it's not my blood. No, wait, Ugh, this isn't going well. It's not blood at all, I think. Actually, do mushrooms bleed? I should have thought about what I was going to say. This is mushroom blood. You have a mushroom, had a mushroom growing in your kitchen. It bled on me. What are you talking about? David Clark asks. His mom shoves past me without a word and hurries down the stairs. I hold my finger up and rub some of the stinky juice around with my thumb. The good news is, I think it stopped. Downstairs, I hear Mrs. Clark scream. Or maybe not. It seemed to really be going. What have you done? David Clark grabs my arm. The moment he does, I hear someone else whisper, Don't touch her. Who was that? But it's too late. He touched me. And once he's in range of the stink from mushroom stuff, he flinches and his eyes cross for a moment. If my brother Roger were here, he'd punch David in the arm and tell him, Two for flinching, asshead. Whenever I'd tell my parents, Roger would say it was just a game. I always hated that game. I bet David would punch Roger back. Heck, he might punch Roger just for being Roger. He just seems like he's got something dark inside him. Nothing, I snap. I told you, it was just a mushroom. David looks at my knocking hand. Why haven't you eaten the cookie? It's not a cookie. Eat it! His face twists in anger. I take it back. He is not a green person. Something in the air seems to change. The mothball smell and the stinky mushroom smell are gone. There's a different odor. I want to call it the rage odor because David seems enraged and I'm now associating that odor with him. I drop the fig newton without even thinking about it. Well, I can't eat it now, I say smugly. He picks it up off the carpet. For a moment, I think he's going to squish it in his hand. But instead, he blows out a long breath, poof, like people do when they're trying to enter their happy place. My mom did this all the time. Lily painted a picture of her best friend's dog dying in art class. Pfft, okay, I'll come talk to the teacher. After he's done this air-blowing ritual, he looks at me. His face all relaxed again and his sad fire blue eyes all deep like pools. Oh, stop it, Lily! He holds the Fig Newton out to me. Five-second rule. Damn it, stupid five-second rule! I take the fruit and cake from him. Look. We can do this the easy way or the hard way, he says. Something in his voice makes my skin crawl. Not literally. Skin doesn't literally crawl. If it did, that looks so weird. Crawling skin is like a feeling of something crawling on your skin. I don't know why people call it making your skin crawl. Maybe it's easier than describing the feeling of stuff crawling on you. What's the easy way? I ask. I don't even know what this is that we're talking about. David nods at the Fig Newton. You eat the cookie. It's not a... You know what? Never mind. What's the hard way? This is the hard way. Mrs. Clark says from behind me before I feel a sharp pain at the back of my head, followed by a hard crunch as I hit the floor face first and... Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. It really helps me out whenever you guys do things like listen, or watch. And it really helps if you guys also subscribe to the podcast, or subscribe to the YouTube channel, or do things like clicking the bell, or clicking the like button. Tales from the Gas Station is back, in case you guys had missed out on that. Tales from the Gas Station Volume 1 and 2 were different audiobooks that I had done for Jack Townsend a couple of years ago, but in case you missed it at the end of last year, also Tales from the Gas Station Volume 3 is available now on Audible. 
You can check it out by looking for Tales from the Gas Station or searching for Mr. Creepy Pasta on Audible or, you know, scroll down to the description and click the links there. And as always, I want to give a very special thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon. You guys are the ones who help me keep lights on the house, as well as allow me to do things like commission brand new stories. In case you guys haven't noticed, we hit that tier. So a very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stricken, Chase Burnett, Deanna Krause, G Weevil 3, Tristan Pelton, 1-800-Nightmare, Acid System, Aaron Stormcrow, Azarine Fox, Bobby Carmen, Chris Lovin, Cryptic Nightmares, The Doctor, Daniel Polson, Dr. Stein and Mr. Happy, Euro Gore, Freddy Krueger, Fried Chicken 12, Hades Nephew, Infertile One, James Bruce, James Lowe, Jason VR Wilson, Jimbo the Hutt, Jordan Nels, Jordan Johnson, Caleb Dougal, Kiri the Sloth, Legit Quadfeed, Liam Newman, Lisa Cottrell, Marco Takes Dabs 420, Michael Scarborough, Nico Kayo, Nina Smith, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Rafael Rodriguez, Robert White, S Man, Sky Harbor, Snails Burnett, Talon Carlick, The Ginger Bros, Trace Miles, Suji Campbell, Tinyny, Unknown Nobody, Andre Garcia, Brianna Wright, Brian Ace, Caspian, Hogunkji, and Someone You Love. And also a very special thank you to everybody who's down there in the description down below. All you guys who are listed as Patreons and everybody who's even supporting for just $1, I really love and appreciate you guys. And if you want to join them, you can always head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. Even a dollar a month, honestly, it keeps the show going. So thank you guys so much. And to everyone out there, sweet dreams. <laughs>